Salutations, respected viewers. Uh, this is George from Ireland. And in this video, I'm going to explain how I, as a conservative, appreciate some aspects of socialism. Well, conservatism. Keeping things the way they are now. Conserving. I suppose you can only be a capitalist conservative if you have a capitalist system uh, already. Now, I spent most of my life in the United Kingdom where the Conservative Party claims to be non-ideological. Um, it doesn't have a, a creed that people have to sign up to. And that's the trouble with socialism, it's sometimes been too ideological and uh, not sufficiently uh, flexible. So, um, as a Conservative, well, what do I favour? Well, I'm a monarch, a monarchist, sorry, <laughs> not a monarch, uh, for sentimental reasons, would like to preserve that, but you could be a socialist and a monarchist as well. Uh, I would like a wide degree of individual liberty. I would like to keep crime down. Uh, I suppose I'd like to solve problems, um, make sure that uh, people are reasonably healthy, if they wish to be. Um, what else? I care about the environment, things like that. I want quality of life. I don't want terrible traffic jams. Um, so that's roughly my, my worldview. But to, to a large extent, I would let people make their own choices, including their own mistakes. Now, um, I was a member of the Conservative Party for quite a few years, fairly active in that. No longer am, though I may come back to it. Well, uh, we could look at butskillism. I could go further back. I shall later. Butskillism was um, this consensus that prevailed in the United Kingdom from the late 1940s until the early 1980s. It takes its name from um, Rab Butler, the Conservative Chancellor Exchequer, for a while, and Hugh Gateskill, was a Labour Chancellor and later um, leader of the Labour Party. So merged their names, Butler and Gateskill. And it was because the two major parties agreed in certain things. During the Second World War, certain things were nationalised. For emergency reasons, it was felt, for the for sake of the war effort, the government needed to harness all the nation's resources to the war effort. And that included coal and um, railways and things like that, as well as um, munitions manufacturing. And uh, most people would agree with this. So even in the United States, um, the government would um, sequester certain things. Say so it's an emergency situation, we all need to pull together. Or well, the War Powers Act was even uh, invoked during the, the Great Depression. Um, and that's the way that we can solve problems. Now, obviously, there are pitfalls with this. Perhaps it's too much of an intrusion into individual liberty. It's uh, taking away uh, property. And uh, the state can mismanage things, just as private businesses and individuals can mismanage things. But um, that was that. After the Second World War, this was made, made permanent. Railways nationalised. Uh, the uh, coal mines were nationalised. A huge compensation was paid to the proprietors. Things like that. It's hard to believe now that in the United Kingdom, there was, um, uh, well, they say British Leyland, the, the, the truck manufacturing company. That was state-owned. British home stores. Uh, really anything with the word British in it was a state-owned company. There were even national restaurants. Um, British Gas, uh, British Telecom, um, more and more. Um, so the, the National Health Service was set up, and as I say, transport was, uh, was nationalised. And the Conservative Party went along with that. The Conservative Party was a bit more capitalist than the Labour Party. Obviously there were plenty of private business, especially small and medium enterprises. People were allowed to own their, own their houses. Now local councils, that's county councils, built lots of houses and rent them out very affordably, social housing. And by the late 70s, about 50% of the population lived in council housing. Very few of them left these days. So the state was doing an awful lot and was taxing more, not, not ruinous levels, but the economy still grew um, really through the Second World War. And there was almost no unemployment from, let's say, um, well, the UK was recovering from the Depression in the late 30s. But from um, ugh, something like 1933 to like, 1973, the UK economy grew almost every single year, sometimes only by a teensy bit. So conservatives can do these things. Now, it's true that Margaret Thatcher came in the 80s and began selling off these nationalised industries, privatisation. And in many, many respects, that was a good thing. And I saw that it led to better innovation and uh, faster economic growth. As people pointed out, under British Telecom, if you said, I would like a phone installed, they'd say, fine, you'll get it in two years. Whereas um, later on, uh, even though we're talking about landlines, of course, in the 80s, you ask for one and you get it in a few days. So there, there are efficiencies in the, in the private sector, but there's also a great deal of wastefulness. Tons of clothes in the United Kingdom are never sold each year, and I do mean tons. Manufactured, marketed, but nobody wants them, 
and they're just dumped. And that's incredibly wasteful. Well, I don't want to go do a command economy. But uh, so conservatives can go along with aspects of socialism. I think the state tried to run all sorts of industries. That was too far. It was British Oxygen Company, which I forgot to mention. Go back to an old Tory tradition of, of, of uh, paternalism. Tory is a slang word for conservative in the United Kingdom and indeed in Canada. Osler and Sadler, two Tory MPs of the early 19th century, and said, we've got to introduce legislation to stop exploitation. For some of the free market fundamentalists in the United States, it's as though the word exploitation has been taken out of the dictionary. Uh, we had um, children going to work as soon as they could walk. Children were not entitled to a schooling at all. Some children went to school. But imagine you were born into a penurious family and never got to school, go to school for a single day in your life. The only jobs you could do were usually abysmally paid. There were decently paid jobs for able-bodied young men, but for everybody else, there were almost no such jobs. Now, there were some middle-aged or elderly men who had well-paid jobs, who were accountants or barristers, but if you came from a poor family, you could absolutely forget it. You were going to be illiterate. So working as soon as you could walk, in abysmal conditions, very long hours in filthy uh, factories, when it was very dangerous, there were no safety rails, could have your limb chopped off, getting on a penny in compensation. For the slightest infraction of the rules, the uh, boss could choose not to pay you. If you broke the contract, it was a crime. Uh, if the boss broke the contract, it was a civil offence. You didn't have the money to start a civil action. So it was a grossly unfair situation. The law was totally on the side of the wealthy. That is privilege. Um, so some conservative um, MP said this is unacceptable and we must do something to better the lot of the average person. Take the Earl, Earl of Shaftesbury, conservative aristocrat, the poor man's Earl, as, as they called him, and he started the 10 hours movement to try and limit the working day to 10 hours. Previously, they'd limited it to 10 hours for children, 10 hours for women. Could men have it down to 10 hours? Doing a physically demanding job in a coal mine or a factory for 10 hours is, is a big ask. And you can imagine that there were some of the extremist capitalists saying, oh, absolutely not, this will ruin us, and they're so idle, we shouldn't be legislating for lassitude, and the state is poking its nose into my affairs. I know how to run my business, back off out of it. Now, in certain jobs, people can work for more than 10 hours, like in, um, uh, in, in offices, or if it's an emergency situation, it might require people to walk, work for more than 10 hours, or in the military or something. But generally speaking, speaking, people shouldn't have to do physically demanding jobs for such long hours. Obviously, their productivity is going to go down. It's unhealthy. They'll be stressed out. They might collapse. People fainted in factories and then fell into machines and got killed sometimes. Um, so go on to what uh, Benjamin Disraeli said the uh, um, conservative prime minister, and who was ethnically Jewish, they converted to Christianity. His um, Jewish origins might appeal to the likes of Ben Shapiro. But uh, Benjamin Disraeli, he wrote these novels saying how the aristocracy um, had to uh, care for the needy. It was the duty of the upper class to provide leadership to uh, those less fortunate than themselves and show philanthropy. And he said the castle is unsafe if the cottage is unhappy. Um, a bit like, uh, I think it, the, the, the sentiment was echoed by, was it Robert Kennedy? That, um, of course, the, the super rich should care about the poorest. Others say, well, she just didn't give, not give a damn, let them fry. Tory democracy was the phrase of the 1880s. Lord Randolph Churchill came up with that one, uh, as in Winston Churchill's father, although he said it was opportunism, mostly, again, which is true. Um, but uh, we, we shouldn't want, as conservatives, we shouldn't want upheaval, crime. We should want unity. Now, by being um, too hardline on capitalism, we seem unreasonable. And we, indeed, we are unreasonable. We open the door to socialism. Socialist arguments are not totally wrong. There is a huge amount of suffering and injustice in the world. Should we try to reduce that or not? I say that we should. Now, I know people have agency. People have to be self-reliant up to a point. But there's only so much people can do for themselves. We are social animals, we share this planet, we've got to cooperate. Resources are finite. There are only so many minerals in the world. Hydrocarbons will eventually run out. When I say minerals, I'm not just talking about diamonds and gold. I'm talking about also, um, uh, well, metals, you know, iron, copper, any of those. There'll be none of that left eventually. So if it's completely maldistributed, that's obviously very unfair on those who are really suffering. Think of that, those billion people in the world today, easily a billion, who are living on a dollar a day. I know that dollar a day might go quite far in, in Bhutan or Mali or so on, but still, 
they have very, very little to spare, might have just enough to eat. I say we should reduce the situation. Now, one of the policies would obviously be a voluntary one-child policy. See my video on that. So some common ownership's not always a bad thing. And I don't know of a single person who's against all common ownership. Even um, the uh, uh, right-wing um, uh, polemicists, the Dyer tribe of Stephen Crowder, Ben Shapiro, Rush Limbaugh, they're not against public ownership of, say, the White House or various military installations or even federal prisons and, and so on. Now, if we don't give a damn about the working class and people who are not even working, those who are poor, what's going to happen? There's going to be more crime. You might say that's appeasement. Well, maybe it is, but it still would reduce crime. Um, if we make sure that they're not starving, they have some basic amenities are provided to them. I know someone will take the bill and still commit crime, but I would suggest to you it would be worse if they really are starving, if they really see no other option. So try to create more jobs. The devil makes work for idle hands. So Thatcher in the United Kingdom, she came into office and said, uh, tackling inflation is more important than keeping unemployment down. Now, um, I've never studied economics. I don't have a settled view on that. But under her, unemployment tripled, despite having pledged to cut it. Got up to 15% at one stage. And obviously it, it, it was um, very localised. In London, South East England wasn't too bad. In some towns in Northern England, in Ulster, in Scotland, it was very high indeed. And so mass unemployment in certain towns, say when pits closed, and that led to a lot of crime and drug addiction. No conservative uh, would, would want that. Um, so some common ownership doesn't have to be a bad thing. Um, you look at um, socialist societies like Cuba under the communists. There's a lot wrong with it. Uh, very little freedom for expression. They're not allowed to leave the country. Um, didn't have fair trials. There are these units to aid production, as in penal servitude, for political dissidents. So a lot of that was, was detestable. But there were some good things too. Imagine you're a cane cutter, the average Cuban, and the communists come along, all of a sudden you have a living wage, you are guaranteed enough to eat. The Cubans have this in their constitution, the right to food. The right to life doesn't mean anything if you don't have food. Um, you could go to school for the first time, adult education, they abolished illiteracy within a few years. Now, no fair-minded person could fail to be impressed by that. It was an astonishing achievement, and this staggering achievement was confirmed by the United Nations. Finally, you have health care. Previously, if you were ill, if you were suffering, that was it. There are not many doctors who are going to you treat you for free, even the doctors willing to provide the treatment. They may not be able to afford the medicines for you. Um, so yes, it relieved suffering. It provided a better quality of life. Things that um, some of these um, struggling, illiterate labourers could only have dreamt of beforehand. So uh, a little bit of socialism can be a good thing. And what do we want? No publicly funded schooling, no publicly funded emergency services. So socialism is not always disastrous. I realise it can go too far. I don't want the state over mighty. I don't want it controlling all facets of our life and, and owning everything. So socialism and indeed communism has sometimes been disastrous, sometimes been bloodily tyrannical. However, that's not to say that all socialist ideas and all socialist policies are always bad. Indeed, sometimes they can be very praiseworthy indeed.